Hello and welcome to this edition of Deeper. It's so good to have you with us. Uh, and as ever, we're going to look at the passage from Sunday and just kind of go a little bit deeper with it and uh, explore it a little bit more than we can do in uh, a fairly short sermon on Sunday. So uh, Sunday I preached on Haggai chapter 2 verses 1 to 9, the second in our sermon series and the last in our sermon series is next week. So I would love you to read the passage again. It's Haggai chapter 2 verses 1 to 9, press pause, read the passage and then restart the video. Fantastic. So as I said uh, last week, Haggai is, is the one prophet who truly dates his messages. Uh, and we all know that um, it says right at the beginning, it says uh, at different points that it happens in the second year, the ki- reign of King Darius, uh, which is about 520 BC. And uh, then he gives very specific dates. And the date for this message is the 21st day of the seventh month, which is, um, is our October the 17th. That's right, October the 17th. Uh, the first message was given towards the end of August, October, uh, so August the 29th. Then they restarted the, the building of the temple on September the 21st. So this is just a few weeks after the restart. And we see in their verses uh, 1 and 2 that Haggai speaks again very specifically to the, the governor, uh, Zerubbabel, and then to the high priest, Shealtiel, and all, then generally, up to all the people of Israel. Uh, so it's a message that goes out very specifically to the leaders, but also generally to everyone else. And uh, what we have is, uh, as I said on Sunday, some negative voices arising as they start to rebuild the temple. And God straight away here in this message, uh, as I said last week, Haggai doesn't pull any punches. He goes straight in. Uh, uh, he says, here's three questions. Who amongst you can remember the former temple? And it's a good question because at this point, it's about 66 years since the original temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians. When they restarted the the foundations, that was 14 years earlier. So about just over 50 years after being uh, destroyed. And at that point, as I said on Sunday, as they celebrated the the laying of the foundations, people wept because it didn't seem like how it used to be. Now, 14 years later, 66 years after it had been destroyed, they're still saying it's not like it used to be. Now, whether there were people still alive who could remember the old temple, or that people were just remembering what those who were alive 14 years ago said about the old temple, because 50 years old would have been uh, a decent age in that uh, time. 70 might have been pushing it a little bit, but uh, 50 was definitely, you know, an age that people lived to. Uh, And so maybe they're just remembering, maybe they're remembering what people said 14 years ago, and they've just started to repeat that. And you know how it is when uh, people say something, whether it's true or not, it can just get repeated. It's repeated as truth. And we see it with all sorts of things these days, don't we? Whether it's, oh, so-and-so down the pub says that he wouldn't trust a COVID vaccination. And that just kind of bubbles along and people pick up on that. Negative voices have a huge impact, uh, far more so than positive voices. In uh, management circles, it's it's quite often said, if you need to challenge someone uh, who you line manage, you need to give them five or six items of praise before you do one negative comment, because the power of the negative comments is so huge. And what it's done here is these negative comments with people saying it's not like how it used to be, that it's just... demotivated those who are rebuilding the wall. The, the, sorry, not the wall, that's another one, uh, the temple. So they've lacked motivation for 14 years. They've not laid one brick on top of another. So as I said on Sunday, there, there was a, a real kind of uh, determination by some to just, just spread negative comments. And that, that, that takes its toll. 
the second uh, question and the third question is God saying, how does it look to you? Does it seem as nothing? And and whether it, maybe it didn't seem as good as the previous temple, uh, maybe it's simply because it was still ruins. It was still being rebuilt. Maybe that's why people were saying it's not as good as it used to be, because some people don't have the vision to imagine what it could be like when something's finished. Uh, maybe they were simply struggling, and this, this would have been true, struggling to get the resources to rebuild the temple. Uh, it would have taken a lot of uh, wealth in order to get the right resources, to get the timber, to get the bricks, to, to get everything in place, to rebuild the temple. And even then, you've only got the structure. You haven't got the, the, the things inside around the altar that it would have had previously. The original temple was filled with treasures that the people of Israel had uh, collected or even picked up as they conquered other tribes and nations. And it had been filled with treasure. It would have been something spectacular to look at. And this poor group of people do not have that. Part of the glory of the temple was the treasures it collected. Uh, and certainly in this new temple, they would not have had that. Uh, and as I said on Sunday, this was a people who had come back from exile, who were, probably had very little and was trying to rebuild their lives and to rebuild their wealth. When Solomon built the, the original temple, it was at a time of great wealth for Israel and Solomon spared no expense. He got the best of the best in. He got the best um, architects in. He got the best uh, craftsmen in. He got the best materials. He spared no expense. And these guys are effectively doing it on the cheap. The, I read somewhere that the, the temple they were trying to rebuild was perhaps bigger than the original one, but nowhere near as spectacular. And so people were looking at this through negative eyes and making negative comments, and it had an impact. And then verses four and five, what we see is an encouragement to be strong. He says it to, to the governor, he says it to the high priest, and then he says it to all the people. He says, be strong. In other words, as I said on Sunday, hold your nerve. Just carry on with the work. Don't stop. Be strong. And it's almost like a mental strength he's, he's talking about. It's not physical here. It's the, the mental strength to keep going even amongst a probably fairly small minority of people saying it's not as good as it used to be. So be strong, hold your nerve. Why? Because I am with you. And we've said time and time again, as we've looked at different passages, the presence of God makes all the difference. It's the presence of God that allows people to press on and to do things that they think are impossible. The presence of God changes everything. And then we see in verse six, uh, God says this, um, for I am with you, and this is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. What is the covenant he's talking about here? It's when you look at the commentators, uh, there's real uncertainty about what God's referring to here. He could have been talking about the, the covenant he made with Abraham that they would have their own land which is kind of relevant because this is the people of God coming back to their land. But God specifically says when he came out of Egypt. And um, maybe it's about God giving the commandments, which was the original covenant of him saying, you, you obey all these things and I'll be with you. And that perhaps seems a bit more relevant because it follows on from God saying, I am with you. And so it's perhaps simply God referring to his covenant with the people of God to be their God and they will be his people, to be with them in the midst of them. Especially as you think about them rebuilding the temple, that was a physical symbol of God's presence in their midst. And so that seems to be the most appropriate way of understanding uh, that particular phrase there. He says, uh, and my spirit remains among you do not fear. My spirit remains among you. So don't be afraid. 
I am with you in the way that I have always been with you. Remember when you came out of Egypt, how I led you, how I provided for you, how I guided you, how I protected you. That's what it meant for God to be with them at that time. And God's saying, as you came out of Egypt, so I will be with you again like that. So there's that kind of connection here with what God did in the Exodus and what God is doing now. Then verses uh, 6 to 8, we see God promising to provide. Uh, he promises, first of all, to, to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I put something in the uh, church email last week about uh, God shaking, and, or at least how the Bible uh, views shaking. It describes that quite a lot in the Bible. And it's usually about dramatic events, quite often uh, wide-ranging events that leave people in a state of shock, or at least uh, in a state of uncertainty. And often those events are caused by nature, whether it's like earthquakes or, or huge storms. Often it's caused by people. When God shakes the heaven, the earth, it's sometimes because another marauding force has come in to oppress people. Uh, and behind both of those things, the Old Testament sees God at work in different ways. And sometimes it's God who directly shakes the heavens and the earth. And the heavens and the earth and the sea is talking about the, how everything will be shaken. And why is God going to do this? He's going to do it to, in order to provide the resources for the temple to be filled. What does it say? It says, I will shake the heavens and all the desires and the desires of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory. That's from the NIV. What is the desire of all nations? Well, it depends on how you translate the, the original Hebrew. If you read uh, some other versions, they have it slightly differently to the NIV. So the New Revised Standard Version, the NRSV, says, I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come, and I will fill the temple with glory. The ESV says, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And the NLT says, I will shake all the nations and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. So in the other versions of how they've translated the original Hebrew, uh, this is about God shaking nations so that in some way their wealth gets translated and transferred to Israel and is filling the temple. As I said before, the original temple would have been filled with treasure and this people had no treasure. And God's saying, I will provide the treasure you need. The Hebrew can be translated as the desired of all nations. And for, for quite a while, certainly with uh, some of the ancient uh, Christians, they looked at this and saw Jesus, the desired of all nations, and that he would come and fill the temple with his glory. Uh, and that is... Is, is a valid way of interpreting it. Uh, most commentators don't look at it that way anymore because of the way they think that the Hebrew needs to be translated. And of course, the next line is, what does God say? All the gold and silver is mine. So it kind of fits better with the fact that this is God shaking the heavens and the earth to fill the temple with the treasures that's needed. Um, so that's what we see here, God providing for his people and that he will fill this house with glory. That, of course, is the glory of the treasures that will come in, but it is also, as it was with the original temple, the glory of his presence. And so the people did not have to fear how they would fill this temple. God himself would do it. God would provide everything they needed. And then verse 9, the glory of the present house will be greater than the glory of the former. They might be worried about how it will look. They might be worried about how they will resource the rebuilding of this temple. And God says, no matter how it looks, no matter what you think about it, I will bring glory to this house. And it's interesting to know that Herod the Great, that same Herod who slaughtered babies when he heard about the, the birth of the, the Messiah, 
he rebuilt this temple. He remodeled it to try and make it more glorious than it was originally. But that was a kind of false glory. The glory that, that really filled this temple was Christ coming to preach in it. That this temple was the same temple that Christ came and was preaching in and was teaching in and overturning tables. This was the glory that we could look forward to, or that the people could look forward to. It's Christ himself. So what does this all mean for, for us as we think about this passage today? So let's go a little wider. So as we think about how we uh, apply this, there are just uh, five very quick things I, I want to say. So uh, the first of all is, is to do with those dates. Um, what we see is here the, the very specific situation um, and the people are starting to mutter a little bit uh, and God speaks into that. Uh, and with those dates, what it emphasizes is that God acts and God acts in history and God acts in our times. Um, and whatever it is that we are working through as individuals or as a church, uh, God acts and he acts at just the right time. This was just a few weeks after the rebuild. God sees what's happening. He sees some of the, the mumbles and the muttering and the grumbling going on and speaks into it directly and quickly. Uh, so that's just one thing I just want to draw your attention to. And if you are ever doing anything for God, you need to know that God is at work in that. He is always at work in that. It might not feel like he is, but you, if you have the eyes to see it or the ears to hear it, he always is acting within our history. Uh, the second thing, which I talked a lot about, so I'll just touch on it, uh, uh, is the futility of comparison. As I said on Sunday, the, the only thing we can focus on is doing what God tells us to do, getting on with the work that he gives us. Neither looking back in time nor looking at uh, to the sideways to see what other churches are doing. We can learn from other churches and we can learn from history. But to keep comparing ourselves as being better or worse is, is irrelevant. It's whether we are being obedient or disobedient. That's the more important thing. And what we see within this context with, uh, with Haggai is the danger of them not following through on what God has told them to do because they've looked back and thought, mm, it's not quite as good. We can't do that. Whatever it is that we choose to do as the people of God, we cannot compare it with times gone by or with other current churches. We focus on the task, the assignment that God gives us now. Nothing more, nothing less. We can learn, but that is all. We don't compare. Which leads me on to the third thing, which is stay focused on doing what God tells you to do. The problem with the comparison is it distracts us. And there are lots of other things that can distract us. And here part of that problem was they didn't have enough resources. They were afraid of oppression and, and uh, persecution and um, opposition. They were afraid of lots of things and fear was a distraction. And there's lots of things just getting in the way of them doing the work that God gave them to do. And it can be like, like that for all of us. You know, if we have family, sometimes family kind of interferes with us, doesn't it? You know, because they they make demands on our time and our energy. Our work, at, where we want to see God's glory manifested in our workplaces, sometimes the the workplace can be really difficult because of the way they bring in all sorts of regulations about not sharing your faith or whatever we can come up with all sorts of things that stop us doing the work of God but in the end we have to be obedient to him and it's a hard thing to try and work out in every particular context but our our mindset should be how do I stay focused on doing the work that God has given me and not be distracted and we can all be distracted the fourth thing is this, that God will provide for us. Whatever it is that we're trying to work through, 
God will provide. God always provides what he calls us to do. And that is a, a thing of faith for us. What has God asked you to do? Have you not done it because you've been worried about either would you have the ability to do it or would you have the resources to do it? Both of those things God will provide. And you cannot use that as an excuse for not doing what God's called you to do. So the challenge for us in this is to hear the word of the Lord. Lord, what do you want us to do today? And when he says, do this, that we do it and we do it with faith and we do it to the best of our ability and we don't do it by comparing ourselves with others and how they're doing things. We simply do what God has called us to do. And that sounds easier (laughs) than actually is because we get so distracted, we compare, we, we sometimes like the faith to believe that God will provide. But simply doing what God has called us to do is the key to it all. And the final thing is just the reminder that God's presence changes everything. I've been involved in a number of um, Christian activities that, to be honest, have often lacked the presence of God. And people have not really sought the presence of God in those activities and then wondered why they were fruitless. And then I've been in other activities where they seemed like they were unimportant. They seemed like they were almost insignificant. And yet because of the presence of God in those activities, lives were changed and the kingdom was allowed to to be brought into situations. The presence of God changes everything. So let's just move on to some questions for you to consider. And uh, I would love you to do that in your missional communities. If you're not part of one yet, as ever, let me encourage you, join one. Uh, If not, reflect on them on your own. So let's go a little bit further. So I've got four questions for you. Uh, And uh, the first one is this, and it's kind of two-parter. How do you feel when you hear negative words about something that you are doing? How does it make you feel? And then translate that. What impact would it have had on those rebuilding the temple to hear negative words about how it looked? Just reflect on that. Just go through the range of emotions and responses that would have brought on. The second question is is this. In what ways can comparing churches be helpful, if at all? Uh, And in what ways is it a pointless exercise? Thirdly, uh, how far are you able to trust God to provide for all that you need in the work that he gives you to do? And finally, and this picks up on what I talked about on Sunday, as we kind of come out of our restrictions and see this new kind of uh, slightly changed world that we're going to live in. Uh, What are the opportunities that you think might be arising to reach out to those who don't know Jesus? What are the new opportunities that you think might be arising to reach out to those who don't know Jesus? And what are you going to do about them? So there you go, four quick questions to reflect on. And uh, that brings our time together to an end. It would be lovely to to see you either in church uh, or online on Sunday. And then do join us for Deeper again next Tuesday. Until then, stay safe and take care. God bless. Bye now.